To cover that story, CBS put together the first World News Roundup, which I later anchored in New York, with hastily hired correspondents in London, Paris, Berlin, Rome, and Washington. And from then on, CBS Radio News just grew and grew, outgrowing the broadcast pattern that required mellow-toned announcers to read the news, and in their place put men who knew what they were talking about, wrote their own scripts, ad-libbed knowledgeably when necessary, were ready to go on the air in emergencies with the requisite background to analyze and explain the situation, whatever it might be. Back in 1933, newspaper publishers decided that radio had scooped the press once too often. They closed their wire services to the networks and demanded the normally free-of-charge radio schedules would now be considered paid advertising. The result was a press war. CBS and NBC suddenly found themselves in the business of getting their own news. It forced them to develop their own news correspondence. Men such as Lowell Thomas quickly became household names. When I started and took Floyd Gibbons' place, I had all the air of the world to myself alone. Seems impossible, both here and in the rest of the world. I had the only daily news broadcast anywhere in the world. The news war went on for two years. Press associations like the Associated Press and the United Press boycotted any product that sponsored a radio program on the networks while simultaneously opening their own radio stations. NBC's first news director was Abe Schechter. What we did was we gathered the news really by telephone. We had 100 or 150 stations on the network. We had the teletypes. We alerted all of them to tell us of what was happening in their area. If it was anything very big, very important. And for instance, New York Police Department has now and had then, I guess, what they call a, a teletype or a communications bureau. And I used to have a regular system. I, give them Rudy Valley broadcast tickets, which was the big show in those days. We weren't so far behind, and when they called us, then we'd follow up on the telephone. The press association began to get worried, especially with President Roosevelt being a huge proponent of radio's ability to communicate. As did the major networks. It wasn't in anybody's best interest for America's two main information hubs to be at war with each other. CBS's John Daly was, at that time, working as a White House correspondent. Your principal function really was just to be there in case of great events, one, and two, to supervise and to put the president on in the event that he had some wish to make a fireside chat or any other address to the country. Needless to say, it's heady wine for a 23-year-old, about 24-year-old young man to, to uh, go over to the White House and have the president uh, greet him as a friend. And those days covering the White House was wonderful fun, you see. There were very few of us. And everywhere the president went, we went with him. He went down to Warm Springs. We'd go down and take two houses on the, on the, at Warm Springs. Uh, this meant that there were 12, 14 reporters there. And if he was invited to a party, we were invited to a party. And, and we had a deep, fine, familial relationship. Eventually, CBS and NBC and the National Association of Broadcasters, who represented local stations, called a meeting with the AP, the International News Service, and the UP. The meeting took place on December 11, 1933 at the Hotel Biltmore. NBC and CBS agreed to drop their news gathering organizations, while the publishers agreed to set up a press radio bureau to furnish the networks with news. But by then, so many local and national radio stations were so successful at gathering their own news, they ignored the press agreement. Here's CBS News correspondent William Dunn explaining. Back in the early 30s, the press associations refused to sell news to us. They just wouldn't let us in on the thing. So White, Abe Schechter, and several others like that uh, got together and organized their own news service. And CBS had a pretty fair little news service going with correspondents in Washington, Chicago, several of the key places. It was effective enough that the press associations got worried. So they agreed to set up an outfit called Press Radio News, which all the press associations contributed to. And they furnished the networks with a certain amount of canned news every day. The Press Association's capitulation was proof of the deepening power of radio's penetration into the American culture. The publishers also had a fatal goof. 
when the German passenger airship, the Hindenburg, was scheduled to make a normal landing in Lakehurst, New Jersey on May 6, 1937. The Press Association assumed it was too ordinary to cover. WLS sent a reporter named Herbert Morrison to cover it so that he could make a recording of the landing for a later broadcast. Slacked up a little bit. The back motors of the ship are just holding it uh, just enough to keep it from... It's rushed into flames. Get this shot. Get this shot. It's flying. And it's crashing. It's crashing. Terrible. Oh, my. Get out of the way, please. It's burning and bursting into flames and, and it's falling on the mooring paths. And all the folks between that this is terrible. This is the one of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's... it's, 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 it's place is 20... Oh, four or five hundred feet into the sky. And it, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now. And the flame is crashing to the ground. Not quite to the mooring mass. All the humanity and all the fans are just screaming around it. I don't do it. I can't even talk to people. There's friends around there. It's a... It's, it's a oh. I, I can't talk, ladies and gentlemen. Honestly, it's just like there are masses smoking wreckage. And everybody can hardly breathe and talk and screaming, lady. I, I, I'm sorry. Honestly, I, I can hardly breathe. I, I'm going to step inside where I cannot see it. <laughs> Charlie, that's terrible. As Europe was headed toward an actual said, war, folks, I, the radio networks quickly began to establish themselves with posts all across the world. Prior to Anschluss in '38 and uh, Germany's investment of Austria. While there were news broadcasts, professional news staffs in the sense that we know them today hardly existed. At that time, for instance, Ed Morrow, who had been director of Talk CBS New York, had changed to uh, European director CBS. This would be, I would think, in 36 or early 37, with his principal function actually to arrange, for instance, for the Pope's Easter message to be broadcast to the United States for the music festivals, etc. It was more a question of special event programming from Europe, as, for instance, my work in Washington was concerned principally with special events. When Anschluss came, as you know, Ed Morrow, frantically looking for staff, found Bill Shira in Spain, where he had been with INS, and sent Shira off to Vienna to cover Anschluss and began to build a European staff, out of which came Severide, Collingwood, etc. Under the impetus of Anschluss, Paul White, who was the father of CBS News, and I think a man to whom the industry owes a great deal and doesn't quite recognize it. Paul White began to build in CBS the great news staff, which uh, saw it through the war years and, and I think took the network to great reputation thereafter. The program of St. Louis Blues, originally scheduled for this time, has been canceled. Representative Maury Maverick of Texas, scheduled at 8.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, will be heard instead at 8.45 p.m. this evening, speaking on the subject, Too Many Battleships and War. Tonight, the world trembles, torn by conflicting forces. Throughout this day, event has crowded upon event in tumultuous Austria. Meanwhile, the outside world, gravely shaken by the Austrian crisis, moves cautiously through a maze of diplomatic perils. Since the German troops crossed the Austrian border on the... On March 13, 1938, backed by William Paley, CBS launched the World News Roundup as a one-time special in response to Hitler's annexation of Austria the prior day. It was hosted by Bob Trout. World News Roundup would soon become a regular program. The program began at the time in the year 1938, when Hitler's Germany imposed Anschluss on Austria, and pretty much for that reason. It was being a nasty winter, and I was home with a bad cold. We had a news broadcast for the day scheduled from Vienna. But Ed Clover, then executive vice president of CBS, called me to give me the bad news that facilities had been denied us. This was pretty rough. During the preceding year, I had been in Austria on a visit during which I had gone to Salzburg with the director general of the Austrian Broadcasting Service to discuss the possibility that CBS would make some special broadcasts of the Salzburg Music Festival. The director general and I had established a very pleasant working relationship. When Clover told me we were being frozen out of Vienna, I picked up the phone and asked the overseas operator to put me through to the Austrian capital, never stopping to think in my feverish condition of the confusion that must be reigning there. I therefore wasn't surprised, as I should have been, when my phone rang back in a few minutes, and there was my friend, the Austrian Broadcasting Director General. 
I told him how distressed I was that his organization was not giving us facilities. Before I could go further, he broke in with a sobbing voice to say, I'm sorry, Mr. Paley. I'm no longer in charge here. I can't do anything for you. You know I would if I could. Then there was a click and the connection was broken. The Nazis had moved in. <laughs>